Our next speaker is one of the better known airmen of World War II. Fresh out of law school, he enlisted in the Army on December 8, 1941, as an air cadet. He earned his wings in 1942, and after assignment to train personnel in air to air gunnery, he joined the 100th Bomb Group, the famous Bloody 100th, as a pilot in 1943. He flew his first combat mission with the 100th on a trip over Bremen, where they lost seven B-17s. It would be one of the next flights that would become the stuff of legend. On that day, 20 B-17s from the 100th set out over a mission over Munster, but only one would complete the mission and return. A command pilot with 52 missions, he was shot down twice and managed to evade capture the last time on his 52nd mission. On that mission, he served as command pilot leading the 3rd Bomb Division on a raid over Berlin. Rescued by advancing Soviet troops, he made his way to Moscow and returned before being returned to the 100th. When the war ended, corrected, correction, when, he, when the war ended, he returned to his old law firm. Shortly thereafter, he was recruited to serve as an assistant prosecutor for the Nuremberg trials. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Rosie Rosenthal. Thank you. I'm honored to be part of this series, and I thank you for the invitation. I'm particularly honored to be part of this panel, these remarkable people on this panel. I cherish the privilege of being with you folks. Uh, unlike the rest of the panel, who went on to brilliant military careers, my service in the Air, Air Corps was limited to four years in World War II. I treasure those years. They're an important part of my life. I have vivid memories of events that occurred during World War II and before. What I can't remember very well are the emotions that I felt during that period. But there were two occasions that I do recall those emotions. One was Pearl Harbor Day, and the other was D-Day. Back in the late 30s, I was attending law school at night, and I attended summer sessions at night. My father had died, my mother and sister we're alive and working. We all had to work. It was the depression to keep our heads above water. And I remember how frustrated I was and angered and the feeling of despair I had when Hitler came to power and he had this theory of, of race superiority and world domination. And how horrified I was when he went into Austria, took over the democracy of Czechoslovakia, and finally, without warning, attacked Poland. And then the war broke out with France, Great Britain, and the Low Countries. And Hitler swept through France and the Low Countries, and only Great Britain remained to resist. And I had tremendous admiration for the British. They hung on by the skin of their teeth. And I was so frustrated. And finally, Pearl Harbor came. And that frustration left me. The next morning, I went down to volunteer as an air cadet. And our country, which had been so split, politically and otherwise, came together as one nation. There was an upsurge of patriotism which endured during the entire war. And 
I became, uh, as I said, an air cadet. I got my wings in September 42. And I was given a questionnaire. Do you want a training command or do you want combat? Do you want to be a fighter pilot? Do you want to be a bomber pilot? And I didn't understand the military philosophy at the time. I asked for what I wanted. You're not supposed to, not supposed to do that. I don't know how things are today. <laughs> are, they, are they any different? But in any event, they gave me training command and ultimately bomber pilot. And I, I resented it. I didn't want to go to training. But they sent me down to Fort Myers, Florida to train gunners in air-to-air -air gunnery. And we worked there from 8 o'clock in the morning intermittently until 8 o'clock at night. And we flew with AT-6s in formation of four, and the lead plane carried a target. And the air gunners would go up there, and most of them had never been in an aircraft, and uh, they usually regurgitated, didn't know what they were doing. They shot at the target and sometimes at the tail of the lead plane. <laughs> but I, I did resent being there, but I realized later that uh, those hours that I accumulated there, and we used to do dog fights on the rare dates that we had, we had off, those hours that I accumulated helped me to survive in combat. We finally were transferred to be B-17 training, went to Sebring, Florida, and then to the garden spot of America, Piote, Texas. <laughs> and from there to Dyersburg, Tennessee, where we picked up our 17, and I named the plane Rosie's Riveters. From the moment I entered the service, I was called Rosie. Anybody whose name began with R-O-S-C was called Rosie. My mother's name was Rose, and there was a popular song called Rosie the Riveter, hence Rosie's Riveters. We took that plane, and we came here to Wright-Patterson, and they modified the plane. They said, this will be ready for combat. We got over, over to England. They took it away. They said it wasn't ready for combat. Gave us another plane. And uh, I was stationed with the 100th Bomb Group. And my first day there was very embarrassing. They took the pilots down to supply, and they gave us a huge briefcase and a watch and a compass and a May West and a backpack and lots of other equipment and an English bicycle. And I had to load all that stuff on me. I'd never been on an English bicycle. On our bicycles at home, we had the brakes on the pedals on these English bicycles that were on the handles. I didn't know that. So I put this stuff on, I started to wobble, and there was a drainage ditch just up the hedge, and you know what happened. I ended up, <laughs> ended up in that drainage ditch, and my head went into the water, and I had to pull the string on the May West to get my head up. <clears throat> and there were all the other pilots up there jeering and laughing at me. That was the worst day of, the, of my stay in the, in the Air Force. 